it, it might get uh, a little bit boring if I just stand here and talk straight for two hours. So please feel free at any time, uh, raise your hand and ask me questions, or at the end of each segment, I'll pause a little bit and then we can talk a little bit deeper into any of the things that you're, you might be interested in. And thanks, Stephanie, for uh, inviting me and for translating my English notes to uh, Deutsch. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'll just start my talk. So, uh, Grissa, hello everybody, and Audrey from the future. Uh, exactly six hours into the future, that is. Uh, and that's the uh, plus eight time zone, and of which Taipei and Hong Kong are uh, in. And you might have heard that in the time zone that I came from, there is currently a protest ongoing, and that's what the first part is about. It's about the Sunflower um, collaborative kind of working. So the Umbrella Movement, or as time calls it, the Umbrella Revolution, has been going on for a week now. There's estimated 200,000 people on the street. And it was um, started because the police uh, arrested uh, their student leaders, the youngest being about 17 years old, and confiscated everything. And, but that somehow uh, incited everybody to go on the streets. And without a leader, they actually organized themselves and become an actocracy, that is to rule by people who actually have ideas of how to do. And then, surprised by the uh, reaction after their uh, leaders being arrested, the police deployed tear gas on the first night, and people, instead of backing off, just brought umbrellas and masks and things, and just do it on the street, and it's been seven days now. And there's some very different uh, behaviors about this um, umbrella movement compared to previous protesting. For example, they're extremely polite and civil, and the streets are actually cleaner in the Occupy areas compared to uh, it was before it was occupied. And uh, there's a lot of media art installations. For example, this is where you can tweet or leave a hashtag on Facebook, and there's been uh, 30,000 messages that's relayed on a, I think, 15,000 lumens projector right on the government walls uh, so that the messages can get across. And also, it's been variously called the, the most technologically advanced protest in history, for reasons we'll shortly see. And somebody actually noticed that it's exactly the same technological stack uh, as the one used in Taiwan in uh, March in the Sunflower Students' Movement. And that is no coincidence, because I've been working with them in Dusseldorf, actually, uh, just seven days ago, uh, to setting up this Tudet Echo for uh, HK website. So if you go to that website, you see that it's actually a, a very uh, interesting list of various sources uh, for people who care about the Occupy Central from abroad, also for people who want to go on the streets but want to get prepared. So uh, first there's a open street mapping team uh, that builds uh, the real-time feed, and this is actually overlaid on Google Map for public consumption. And then there's a time mapper that uh, um, collects all the reports from those various stations because there, there's no central um, authority, so to speak, so everything is uh, crowdsourced and then mapped on this time map. And then, of course, on each uh, important points, there's uh, three or four different cameras, and there's a uh, real-time interaction where people could chat on the chat room on the sidebar to talk with the people holding the camera or manning the camera station. In, in a sense, it's like, the Twitch place, the revolution. I don't know if anyone gets the reference. And then uh, there's a lot of spreadsheets used in the in Hong Kong this time. Uh, for each column, that's a occupied uh, area or station. And for each row, that's the thing that they need. For example, they need soda powders, they need towels, they need uh, eye masks and things like that. And there's like uh, the uh, red on black means it's being and has surrounded by anti-occupation people. So they like need people to go there and help and things like that. So it's, it's all coordinated in real time uh, on Google Spreadsheet. And so, so how is this built? Um, if one click the pencil icon on the center, uh, you can get into the edit area, the, the Arbeiter area, and which is actually just a spreadsheet with links on the A column and the description on the B column. 
And uh, so, uh, and it's easy to fork. Actually, one of the student communities, the HK926, has forked the entire hack builder into their own domain, HK926. HK, and they have a special team that uh, verifies and confirms each of those crowdsourced information and only publish the verified ones as well as the refuted ones on a separate tab. And because all of this is uh, updated in real time, it's also very easy to merge them back in because uh, the, the first hack folder can just add a new entry to the verified path because they share the same URL. So uh, it's easy for them to go start new hack folders and to join uh, the contents from the second hack folder back to the first one. So that's how it, how it was organized. And so to get into this point, let's go back in time, actually, to look at how uh, spreadsheets are invented. It has its many things to do of how to get there. So back in 1977, there's this guy called Denver Quinn. Uh, at that time, he's been programming for maybe 10 years professionally. And he enrolled into the Harvard Business School because he wanted to learn how to run a startup. And uh, the Harvard Business School, as part of their semester class, uh, tells every student to prepare a business plan for a startup. And because Denver Quinn, at that time, has seen Steve Mann, who's wearing this head-mounted display back in 78, um, very advanced technology. And also that year was the, when Alto uh, Workstation was demonstrated to, to the public. And that's, of course, the calculator that every uh, student was using. So Denver Quinn uh, took a look at the, the combination of these three new technologies and com compare it with the technology used by the professor uh, in Harvard, which is the chalkboard and the eraser. And he thinks that oh, I can make a better blackboard. So um, what, what his idea was to uh, remove the, the uh, to make a cut on the bottom of the calculator and install a trackball there so that each calculator becomes a mouse. Does that make sense? And uh, uh, each person would then just wear a head-mounted display and use the calculator as a mouse to enter this shared uh, virtual reality that would be a shared blackboard. So the use case is like each student wears this display and then use their calculator mouse on a shared blackboard and they will just all write different numbers and then they get updated in real time and there's a recalculation that updates the, the summation of those groups. And so that's actually the business proposal. I, I, I don't think he got a high score for that, though, because first, uh, it is mighty unaffordable at that time. It was very expensive, those head-mounted displays. There's no way Harvard can buy each student uh, one of those head-mounted displays. And second, the computing power at that point was uh, at the Apple II was the height of the um, computing power, so uh, there's no way to run such a uh, virtual display. So he scaled down in his ambitions and uh, did this very tiny software called VisaCalc that just manages the um, spreadsheet as if it's on a tape. It's, um, I have a lot of nostalgia for that. That's how I learned programming. And so, so yeah, but there's a crucial difference between his original vision and this version of the implementation in that this is a uh, file and disk based implementation. The original vision was a collaborative space, but this was uh, files on disk. And so uh, after that, there's Lucas 123, Excel, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, whatever. But if you're using files to store spreadsheets, there's a lot of back and forth, and the space is fragmented. And if you have ever worked out with this new technology called email, then that's uh, very, very uh, tiring, because then you have five different versions, and it's very difficult to reconcile them in the inbox. But uh, in 2001, there's a good solution to this problem of uh, back and forth with files, and that's Wikipedia and Creative Commons both launched on the same year. And the idea behind Creative Commons and Wikipedia was that everybody could collaborate on the same document, and the document would just automatically maintain its own versions. And Creative Commons ensure that each version is free for other people to take to other pages, and then the modifications can always, at any time, be incorporated back to the original version if people think it's good. And if people think it's bad, then it's just reverted. So this is what we call the wiki way. And uh, two, two years after Wikipedia was announced, uh, the software behind uh, 
Wikimedia Media Wiki uh, was uh, announced as free software. And I think that's for me at least the start of the Sunflower movement because it just so happens that Media Wiki's logo is a sunflower. So, um, and uh, the thing of it being a free software is that if you're not happy with Wikipedia, you can set up your own Wikipedia at any given time. And people have done so in Wikia in a lot of different installations. And uh, so, so that people can get control of their own media. And this is Sumit Wilhelm, uh, many, many years before uh, MediaWiki. He had this uh, famous saying that the media uh, is the message. And uh, the, the way he used it is using a light bulb as the metaphor. Like uh, when it's nighttime and it's very dark, a light bulb by itself, it does not convey any message per se. But people know if there is a light bulb that they can surround over it, they could discuss things over it, they can uh, show things they've made, their writings, and it becomes visible by the light bulb. So the light bulb is actually a kind of message that says, hey, here uh, is um, something that's happening and everybody come. I actually, I, I saw that on the, uh, on the Meta Lab page, actually, for this talk. Um, there's a, a tag that, that just says uh, WTF equals uh, comes very very but everybody it's very exciting and things like that. So this is a kind of uh, a call to uh, participation. And the other part, the wiki part, as used by Ward Cunningham, uh, we, we would see that actually he does not use the word uh, editing or working or things with wikis. He always used the words like gardening. So instead of maintaining a wiki, he yeah, always in gardening a wiki, a wiki gardening, like growing uh, culture and growing thoughts around this space, and naturally it forms a community. So uh, both the idea of space and the idea of communities are embedded in the very act in open sourcing or releasing as free software, the media wiki uh, installation. And after that, it, it inspired a, a generation of coders and activists to uh, reshape their uh, software that was using the back and forth metaphor into this collaborative editing metaphor. And one of the programmers that was inspired was Dan Bricklin. And so he was like, yeah, I've thought of this before. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible now. So then uh, he rewrote uh, BusyCalc in uh, web languages. And then he released WikiCalc and then partnered with Social Text uh, under Rose Mayfield to develop it into a pure JavaScript version of uh, the BCCalc idea. And so it becomes collaborative and like uh, Wikipedia or MediaWiki has versions and you can save it and things like that. But more importantly, they released it under uh, open source license called uh, Social Text Open. And because it's released under open source license, people from one laptop per child took it and incorporated into the classroom, and people from Drupal, for example, took it and integrated it into their content management systems. And uh, one of the people working on OLPC, uh, the CETA Labs, um, tried to uh, take a step further because um, before, SocialCal would have used a central uh, storage server, and everybody would collaborate there and save new versions there, but they uh, incorporated on the mesh networking idea which is built in by OLPC. And that is actually used this week extensively, as well as in, in March uh, in, in Taiwan. This is a completely insecure uh, but open uh, implementation of mesh uh, networking. And the idea is that everybody's phone using Bluetooth and 3G and Wi-Fi and any kind of connectivity it could get will just relay information from one to another so that the, the moving people become their own routers and they become their own internet. And the real-time information that we just saw on that spreadsheet actually started uh, its crowd primary source on those uh, fire chat networks. And uh, on 2008, there's a bunch of people uh, released this Etherpad uh, collaborative editor, which took this idea but uh, pushed it into real time so we can see everybody's cursor uh, in a different color. And then they got bought by Google to work on Google Wave, which pretty much nobody uses now. But be before they got acquired, they did a uh, very good thing, which is the open source Etherpad's code base. So other people like the Power Party, the uh, French PharmaPad, the uh, Mozilla Notepad can just continue to work. And once uh, Google Wave has folded, some of the original team of Etherpad 
got back and applied for a Y Combinator and had a new startup called Hackpad. That took either had idea but made it even more friendly. They call it the wiki of the next generation. And actually a lot of the unstructured data and uh, text feed from both the Taiwan movement and the Hong Kong movement are done exactly on Hackpad. So in 2011, I had this um, idea to try out a new technology called Node.js. And then I rewrote the social calc engine into Node.js and called it EtherCalc. And it's a homage to the EtherPad people and it's for structured data, for tabular data. And, and it's featured on Prism to break, actually, because for some reason people don't want Google to host their private documents. I think the public ones are fine. Uh, so yeah, because it's very small footprint, you could very easily install on Raspberry Pi or something. So um, people who, are, who want to work on offline fashion and anonymous fashion because it doesn't require login, uh, prefer either calc. And in actually the two hack folders in Hong Kong and also in Taiwan, the, the editing button first started uh, displaying either calc. So on the first two days of uh, the protest, there's no need to sign in, no need to have a Google account or anything. You can just start typing in the information you think that people would want to see on the sidebar. And then people, even though it's very chaotic and there's no like accountability anyway, everybody is anonymous, still the contributors overwhelmingly went one over the trolls and we get uh, all the uh, information that we need in the first 48 hours. And after it stabilized, we just then copied everything and shipped it into Google Spreadsheet so that um, people could uh, comment on it still, but it's restricted to the uh, people who are uh, more involved to it full time, at, at which time I finally don't have to stare at my computer 24 hours a day. And then, uh, but this, this thing, this hack folder that takes the spreadsheet and renders it into a sidebar, uh, that was done in 2013, and it has actually nothing to do at first uh, with civic movements. It, it's a community tool that we use to manage our own uh, hackathons that takes place in hackerspaces, just like this one. So that's the second part of my talk. But any questions or anything people want to talk about about the first part? Okay, thank you, Akru. Right, um, so the Top Zero community. The Top Zero community uh, has started at late uh, 2012, and it's a response to this assertion by the writer John Da Chen, uh, who's like the, the most prolific and respected writer of our generation in Taiwan, and also a hopeless Facebook addict. So, um, because he cares a lot about social uh, welfare and civic movement and things like that, uh, Wired um, interviewed him in early 2013 and asks whether you think that Facebook is an instrument for civic engagement as, as you would hope so. And but John Hatchin said, no, of course not. Uh, I can be very sure and tell you that all Facebook does is to make people feel as if they have involved and participated. And at that time, the common idea was that maybe 10,000 people would press like or share or something. But if you organize a offline movement, then maybe just 10 people will show up. That's the, the common idea at that time. So it's not connected. And a, a blogger uh, and an activist, uh, PhD, uh, analyzed this, um, um, what's the English? Learned helplessness uh, into the, its root causes. And this, this is actually uh, not particular to Taiwan. This applies to all, all sorts of uh, disconnected offline and online activism uh, people uh, all over the world. The main idea is that the, the nonprofit organizations, they're not savvy in their use of online usage, but that actually make those individuals feel even more powerless in influencing politics. And then that in turn makes the online participation sort of symbolic, not transferring to the offline. And that made hackers, like open source people, feel like this is none of our business because it has very little effect anyway. And so that created a generation gap between the people who had maybe 20 years of offline activism uh, working, but has knows very little about social media or internet, and people who knows a lot about technologies, but just does not care about social issues. 
and that's uh, the situation uh, when Gov Zero was founded. And Gov Zero was founded exactly to combat this problem. So how did, did we do it? In, in 20 months, uh, the main way we did it was to organize more than 20 hackathons. Uh, usually the bi-monthly large one, there's more than 100 people participating. And because of the venue, we can only accommodate 160 people. So the people who overflew just uh, set up their own hackathons in other cities, and then just became a island-wide movement. And then uh, we amassed a lot of offline contributors who showed up for those face-to-face -face, um, hackathons and uh, brought their own projects or get adopted to existing projects. And there's over 1,000 different people. And then we just gave talks everywhere and it seems to work pretty well. And of those 1,000 regular contributors, uh, by far the most um, concentrated space is IRC on Freenode. Uh, we're on freenode.gov0.tw. And about a quarter of our contributors are there. There are many other places like GitHub and Hackpad and, and Edercloud, but uh, the IRC has the, the most con uh, concentrated people. And we have a very good balance. Uh, about 30% um, are activists or people actually working in the government. And then about 40% coders and 30% designers. And so uh, when, when new people came to a hackathon, we have a lot of stickers, actually. There's one set of sticker that's a, a deer that looks like a deer in the spotlight. Like, very naive means that I'm the first time in the hackathon. So people could just put the stickers on them. And then there's a Taiwan bear, which means uh, people who are seasoned, they've been to more than two hackathons and so willing to adopt newcomers. And then people would just uh, put the stickers on. And then we have stickers for specialties, like the TXT sticker is for storytellers, because they're working on text. And then JavaScript, CSS, design, law, and all sorts of specialties. So people would just uh, put the stickers on them and then uh, hear each project making five minutes of elevator pitch. There's maybe 15 projects to 20 projects at the beginning of the hackathon at uh, 9 a.m. And then people just automatically separate into groups working on things. And for the newcomers who stay on the same spot looking lost, uh, they would get adopted by, by uh, people more experienced. So online is a very friendly way of working. And uh, in addition to the large hackathons, each project also hosts uh, its own smaller meetups, about 30 people or so, and there's one every weekend, um, sometimes two every weekend. So, so how do we get those people to, to join or to form? Uh, there are three steps. One step, the first one is open source, because um, the open source people are the people, or free software people are the people who could work without coordination. So we have to get them engaged first, because those are the bootstrappers. But how do we get them engaged? Well, to get them angry or upset about particular things. Uh, outrage is always the uh, first step, the zero step, actually. So uh, the instigating point for Gov Zero came uh, in 2012, October 16th. Uh, there's a law that has passed, a bipartisan law, because the um, housing price due to speculation is very, very high in Taipei especially, but over Taiwan, and there's very little uh, that the government did to, uh, to do about it in maybe 10 years of this just hyper speculation. And so finally the government responded saying, okay, okay, we will uh, tax it by its actual transaction price. And as part of it, it mandates all the transactions to be registered in the actual price. And there's a government website that just lists uh, in raw format, uh, each row being one transaction, its date, its price, the area, the street address, um, and the rough street address of the, the transaction. So, um, but that had a unintended consequence because there's four uh, hackers um, in Google Taiwan who, one, uh, I think one of them happens to have worked on the Google map. Uh, so, so they did what they do best, which is to extract data and then visualize it on Google map. They, they did this very, very nice interface that used the bubble radar diagram so that you can zoom out and see an average um, land price and sort it by the kind of housing and by the recent like three months ago or the year running average. And if you zoom in, then you can actually see the average uh, per kilometer, square kilometer price to each street. And that's very, very handy and very, very useful. 
But the problem being, of course, they, they don't nominally have the right to do so. They just bootstrap themselves. So um, they, that was a chance. This is the, the um, idea of a letter to citizen participation. Um, yeah, at that point, they just brought a level three, which is information published, uh, all the way up to level eight, because then people have conversations and uh, ways to start influencing uh, housing prices. They're no longer uninformed. But um, uh, the, the government is not exactly happy about that. So then they set up this talk with those developers and try to figure out actually how much uh, like secrecy or rights or uh, copyright or things like that uh, that they have to adhere to. But then um, the week of the meeting, something very unfortunate happened, which is this very handy tool gets reported on public media. And the way the public media narrative storytellers, they chose to frame it, was the, the Chinese here reads, uh, a million dollar disaster versus a uh, $500 success. Um, because they interviewed the developers to, and asked how many Taiwan dollars did you spend on this project? And they're like, oh, well, actually the only cost has been the hosting fees, which is a much, maybe $500. But then uh, it, it's, it's a very unfortunate way to pitch this million dollar admittedly not very usable government website versus this open data visualization because one builds on another, right? It is another competing effort. But once built this way, the government people aren't, aren't very happy. They're, they're like pretty angry actually. Um, so uh, then they sort of escalated. So the week after, all of those published raw information just became uh, JPEG um, like uh, image files. So obviously somebody, <laughs> Uh, don't want people um, to sort of spread information from it. And when asked by the media, uh, the government people said, oh, that's because we, uh, the, the crawlers have been costing us too much bandwidth. So we switched from text to image to conserve bandwidth. I'm not exactly sure they knew what they were talking about, but... <laughs> okay. So um, some, some of the hackers who would later lead a lot of GovZero projects actually look into OpenCV and Tesseract and OCR technologies just because of this and because they now are outraged as well. And, but then, then the government could just keep escalating. They could start adding noises or switch to Shopware Flash or, you know. So yeah, it's, it's an attrition. So there, there's no sense in continuing. So after um, an intensive talk, um, the, the civilian team just uh, removed their, their effort. So that's a sort of a way to, to reform the hackers, to, to say that, okay, thanks for the inspiration. We will tell our IT department to redo our UI to be closer to yours, but please don't uh, set up these unofficial installations. So that's back to level two, which is trying to reform the hackers. So um, now to their credit, uh, and for the record, a year after this incident happened because of the GovZero and movement and a lot of discussions with the government, they did eventually release it as open data and fitting the open data criterion. But that took a lot of work and a lot of lobbying. But at, at that time in history, uh, we were all very pretty angry. And then three days later, there's uh, another thing that uh, came out on YouTube, which is this uh, YouTube video and also a, a prime time TV commercial because the executive branch was pushing this literally five year plan uh, called the economic boosting plan. And the plan is very complex and we're fine with it being very complex. By the way, they talk about it was they did this video that just says it's very complex. It is too complex to explain. So just don't ask about the details, just go along and, and go with it. And then it just repeated three times in the video and that's the entire propaganda. And, and so it, it just makes no sense. And so, and that video predictably went viral. And then uh, within, I think, 12 hours, people just keep clicking the report spam or abuse button on YouTube so that the government's YouTube account is canceled because it's a spam account, as you will see. And so, so yeah. And then the government appealed to YouTube saying, uh, we're not a bunch of liars. Oh, well, we may be, but our YouTube account is not. So please restore our YouTube account. Uh, this is a mistake. 
And uh, in October 19th, YouTube is like, okay, uh, you're a government, we restore your account. So the, the YouTube video is back on air. So that made uh, four hackers, uh, CEO and three friends, uh, very unhappy. And they actually enrolled into the Yahoo Hacker Day uh, at that point, and they intended to do a Amazon window shopping-like website. But because of this video, and because of this video still being aired, they changed their um, project on the very last minute. And so they did something else entirely. And they used D3JS to, to do a budget visualization. And this is by uh, defense, social welfare, education, and retirement pension. And then they show each individual grid uh, according to the color. Like if it's being deleted over time, it's red. And if it's being increased over years, then it's green. And if you mouse over it, uh, you can see it's trend and things like that. So basically, they took a lot of time to take those tabular data out of PDFs and then use them to do a visualization. And their idea is that if it's too complicated to explain, maybe it's, the problem is not that it's too much information, it's just you don't have access to D3JS. So, um, and they also did a tree map that boils down the um, budgets down to the departments and the uses, and they have a uh, people who upvote or downvote any specific budget uh, movement and also people calling for deletion, and there's a, a discussion on each um, side of the, the budget item. So, so that, that won them a, a award from Yahoo Hack Day, and a, they used that about uh, 100 euros to, to make a hackathon on their own. And they call it a, the first hackathon of martial mobilization which is a very angry uh, title. We, we, we're, that's probably the, the most angry title actually we used in of the 10 hackathons because people were really very angry at that time. So then they, they saw maybe 30 people would come, so they booked a 30 people venue, but then people just kept overflowing in their online registration and finally they switched to Academia Sinica, and which allowed for more than 100 people and indeed more than 100 people came. And so these are the open source hackers who have no idea whatsoever, usually, about social activism. They just, just know that the government is treating them as stupid and they don't really want to, uh, the government feel that they're stupid. So they just picked random parts uh, of the government websites, the Congress, geographies, the weather, and the electric grid, because there's a nuclear plant debate here. And then there's a lot of other, like, healthcare and other informations. And because they're, uh, collaborating on Hackpad and IRC all the time anyway. So it didn't end like most hack days would after an entire day of work. They continued on their own Hackpad and their IRC channels. And the designers and the storytellers who <coughs> came to the hackathon also formed Facebook groups because that's what they know best. And they also worked on the, the narratives and the branding for the project. For example, this is the the logo that we used on this Zero's hackathon, which is very, very ugly. So uh, there's a pretty famous designer who came to the hackathon and he just couldn't stand it. And so he, he did something better and then he evolved and evolved and finally um, became a very uh, visible visual brand. And so uh, after many months of work, there's a lot of projects. Oh, and I, I should say that all these um, websites that's being put up on the, by the hackers we used a hack because we um, registered for the gov0.tw uh, domain so that any, um, for example, the, the land data uh, was in land uh, ivr.gov.tw and if you change the gov to g0v, then you drop into our version of the website. So for each government website domain, because they all end in gov.tw, and if you change the O to zero, then you drop into a more accessible and, and then open API JSON and or XML version of it. Uh, isn't that a great hack? Right. So um, after after pulling this off and running for like three or four hackathons, um, inevitably the the problem of government governance came up. Like the the reporters would want to speak to somebody, or people would ask oh, what is an allowed project and what's not an allowed project. So uh, we talked about it in OSDC Taiwan that year, and then we came to the conclusion that we will model ourselves after the IETF, which means anarchy actually, <laughs> which means it's very decentralized, that no project speak for any other project, 
and no one individual representing Cap Zero because it's a platform, it's a space, a home, and then it's a, a way of doing things, but it's not a organization. So nobody could speak for Cap Zero. Everybody speak for themselves. And we're transparent so that when we're making data available, we're also making the code that make the data available and the open source and creative common licenses. So anybody could just rerun it and if they don't like the interpretation or the visualization, just fork it and have a new version for it. And so the, the entire idea was to model ourselves on something that made internet work, which is uh, rough consensus and running code, which means that we don't have to agree on any direction whatsoever, we just agree on a protocol, which is to be transparent and share our work. And that actually was very well explained by somebody's PhD dissertation, uh, and uh, which I will quote the first three points, because they apply very well. In that, uh, for anybody who comes to our hackathons, we don't ask if their project fits in Gov0 or not. If they gain enough attraction like to other people, then it's a project. Otherwise, it's just an individual, but it's fine as well. It belongs to the space. And all the rituals, like the monthly, bi-monthly, and weekly hackathons, we, we celebrate, and we fill them into content with whatever that is trending that day. So uh, if there's a social injustice, injustice, then people would just collaborate and like put their original projects aside and focus on it. And on more peaceful times, people would just uh, go about do, doing their own projects. So that's the, the basic idea of organizing it. So that's the first step, getting the open source people angry and get them committed. Now the second step is also open source, uh, but it's the, the other way around, get the existing activists to work in the open source way. Because uh, be as it may, uh, they, they may have a lot of experience in doing activism, but it was a, in a pre-internet or even pre-digital era, and some of them are even more centralized or even more bureaucratic than uh, actually the establishment that they're fighting. And it, it's not their personal problem, but it's a, a generation gap, so that we bring the tools to them and try to show them that the way of open source works much better and there's much less burnout uh, this way. And what is the open source way of working? It is to, to work with our central coordination, the decentralization way. So uh, as we already saw, that even uh, the designer can just improve on the branding or the logo decentralized fashion. Uh, he doesn't have to ask anybody. Actually, there's many, many different variations because he released his designs uh, under Creative Commons Zero, so uh, like disclaiming all copyright, so you don't even, don't even have to credit even for it. You can just make adaptations, and people have made a lot of adaptations. And another uh, example is this called the, um, the Journal of Anger. And this came about because an, an activist um, hacker uh, saw this um, development website of a public construction project that's on, it's called the Beauty Bay, which is a shoreline development project that involves a very questionable environmental um, assessment and also very uh, questionable way of acquiring the land in the first place. But if you go to their website, there's a beautiful timeline that shows how many, many jobs it will bring and how many, uh, like, how much the, the price of land will grow because of this and how many promise of hope of employment of things like this, this project will bring. I see that people are very familiar with things like this. So yeah, I mean, it's the same everywhere in the world. So uh, what, what we're, we would do is that uh, the activist, after looking at this timeline, became very angry. And so uh, he wants to launch a, a uh, website called anger.govzero.tw and there, there is no such government website. There's no anger.gov.tw but, but they were just so angry that, that they, they don't want to match with the government anymore. And what, what they uh, planned was to uh, list all the social movements so that's across the trade agreement, the Sunflower Students Movement, the uh, uh, general strike of uh, people who are um, forced to close their fic uh, factories, and, and so on and so forth. And so list all the social issues and in the chronology way, like just like the timeline, and using timeline.js uh, to have a play-by-play -play, um, timeline of what actually happened in those movements. That technology uh, with OpenStreetMap actually got used in uh, Sunflower Movement and also in Hong Kong this week. And But we convinced the, the group on GitHub issues that, that anger, that Gavzirubatiyev, is really, really not a good domain name. Uh, so they agreed to uh, rename it to fact. 
So, so now it is the political fact that of zero that TW. And then we did another hack, which is uh, all the source information uh, you see here is actually from Wikipedia, because all this project is is a Wikipedia parser. It parses any Wikipedia article whatsoever and plug dates from it and citations and sources and then put it into a spreadsheet and then display it here. So you can actually visualize any Wikipedia article as long as it has dates in it using the same code base. And because of uh, the quality of social movement Wikipedia articles is not actually uniformly high. This has the other effect, which is promoting collaboration into the Wikipedia articles, because if people are not happy with the timeline, we just tell them, go and edit that Wikipedia article and add a photo, add sources, add precise dates, add newspaper references. So it also has the ability of making the uh, Wikipedia community very happy, because that's our primary source. That's another example of collaboration. It's called the News Helper. It's a browser extension project that runs on Chrome, Safari, uh, and Firefox. If you install it, then uh, um, next to each Facebook uh, posting, a fa Facebook link that's to a news um, a press. For example, the example being used here is that Korean media reports that the, a Korean ancient civilization has been found on the moon, and NASA de declined. Uh, denied it. And so this is like obviously the Onion kind of news, but uh, it appears on mainstream media nevertheless. And so there's a lot of like bogus thing like the, the Beijing smog is so bad that people put up LED screens to watch sunrise. Uh, that never happened. So uh, uh, things like that. So, so next to like and share, uh, if you install that browser extension, there there will become now a new link that says uh, report fake news. And if you click report fake news, then you ask for a URL of the evidence uh, refuting the news. And then if there's more than one people uh, reporting for a particular link, then it's recorded. And then uh, people start seeing before they click share a warning that uh, is modeled after the Windows, uh, genuine Windows warning. Warning, you may be a victim of counter fake news and things like that. <laughs> so, um, and, and that, that's, that actually took off. People very um, actively participated in uh, reporting fake news. And so this is the way that uh, we, instead of hating the media, be, sort of became the media. That became very handy um, a few months um, after this was released when the mainstream media f for the first time started reporting inaccurate information about Gap Zero. And then uh, we work with the liquid democracy people in, uh, I think in Germany, Iceland, there's the Lumia team from New Zealand, there's a, a lot of people working on online democracy. We, we started off just experimenting and using it for our own hackathons and hackerspace management, but then people from Green Party Taiwan or from other traditional, more traditional political activities, they became even more interested in this sort of thing than, than we are. So then the traditional open source hackers are. So then we collaborated and then they sent people to actually translate the entire interfaces and uh, make new mockups and send people to collaborate with the democracy folks and things like that and that powered uh, the online presence of those um, uh, activists. And after that, we, we then did another, what we call Congress Matters, which is a website, and it's ly.g0.gov0.tw because the legislative is ly.gov.tw. So if you change the O to zero, then you drop into a parliament page that has each bill with its own URL and using a very familiar to engineers view, a div view, um, what, what, was the, what was the bill before and what was the proposed div and what's the proposed rationale, just like a GitHub uh, line by line comment. So this is a lot of work. Uh, we, we used LibreOffice to parse original Word documents and collaborate with PDF documents and, and so on and extract them into JSON so that each proposal is within an hour uh, given its own unique URL and then you can see who proposed it and who signed on it and what's its uh, state of debate and, and how soon it will enter the next round and things like that. And then there's a, a per section hyperlink to the uh, anchor to each section as well so that you can very easily go to that section and then share it on 
say Facebook or other social media. And this is the, the marriage equality uh, proposal, which went viral, and then people, many people learned of the Congress Member website for the first time. And then a, a few months after this goes online, uh, one of the <coughs> um, more prominent ruling party legislators appeared on television in an interview sort of panel and said that people could generally trust me because I'm a, a legislator who vote with conscience. I often vote contrary to my party line and uh, I'm bipartisan and I, people of all colors of all parties should support me and, and so on and so forth. And, but it just so happens that we also have a page of voting records of legislators. And so that on this particular legislature voting page, you can see that there's zero out of line uh, conscience votes. Uh, every single of his votes are his party's votes. <laughs> and so, so that link went viral, and we have Facebook discussions under that. And, and then uh, I think his office said something about now he is referring to the previous term or the term before that. So we had to dig up uh, those PDF and Word documents again and parse for the earlier term and found that there's again no uh, out of the line voting. I mean, people just saw that they could make this sort of claims uh, and expect people to buy it because before it would take a lot of effort to correlate that with fact, but now this is automatic. So after this made around in news, nobody dared to make anything uh, <clears throat> so wildly out of reality uh, after that. And then, uh, and then people started their recall campaign too for this particular legislator, but that's another story. And then, uh, so in addition to uh, opening up the legislative, we also did it in a crowdsourced fashion, what we call the Congress Cinema. So uh, actually the legislative yuan, the parliament, have a real time live feed for their debates, but it's, uh, I think, Microsoft Media Player only, uh, it, it's, using an ancient version of the DRM that's not even DRM anymore, and it's IE specific. So not many people uh, watch it, uh, in fact. So uh, what the, the hackers here did uh, in the second year of Yahoo Hack Day, that's exactly one year after Gov Zero was founded, uh, did this uh, Congress Cinema as their Yahoo Hack Day project, and they converted the uh, IE only feeds into using N Nginx RTMP, into the multi-format so that any uh, mobile phone or any tablet can watch it. And then they added to it real-time interaction so anybody could press a button and deliver a flower to the person currently speaking and then or to press a button and throw an egg or an, a shoe or press a button and have a net that bounces off the shoe. So it becomes a sort of interactive playground and that made it um, quite a bit more interesting than watching C-SPAN. And then anybody could type in the chat, uh, in the chat box down there and it would just fly over the, uh, the video footage. So it only became a, a cin cinematic experience. And so uh, it, it came on uh, mainstream media and the reporters interviewed the people in the parliament, uh, wondering how they feel about it, and then they're like, oh, of course, we will uh, behave more carefully now that we know people are rating us. And, um, and the hackathon after that, there's a lot of uh, legislators' assistants coming <laughs> to the hackathon. They, they all want to uh, learn how to do sort of SEO, uh, how to make their legislators look better on the, on the cinema, on the, on the records here, and then we get a lot of uh, friends and support from the, the legislative themselves. So, uh, so that's a pretty nice hack. <coughs> but, uh, so the offline people generally uh, start to learn about this open source way of working and the activists generally start to, to, to hear about the open source. But actually what uh, brought the, these two kind of people together uh, was at a conference in August last year. And this is the Coast Cup conference. It's the largest conference on open source in Taiwan. There's eight parallel track of talks and more than a thousand attendees. It's like OSCon uh, in Taipei. And so it, it's pretty large. And on that particular year, there was a incident called the Hong Zhongqiu accident that involves a soldier serving uh, in the military and was accidentally murdered. And there's no um, footage whatsoever. 
there are closed cameras around all the exercise and discipline rooms, but just on the two hours or so around the incident, uh, when they drew up the footage, it became black. So obviously somebody's been hiding the, the evidence. And that pre, uh, provoked a lot of outcry. And a bunch of people, 25 people, calling themselves the 1982, uh, 85, which is the telephone number in the military that the soldiers call when there's an emergency, um, just uh, gathered on PPT, which is like the, a bulletin board system that's like Reddit uh, for Taiwan. And then they uh, organized a flash mob uh, in the front door of the defense uh, building to protest. And much to their surprise, uh, I think more than a, a thousand people came. They, they thought maybe just a bunch of uh, Redditors <laughs> would come, but uh, people just spread the news. And then it became sort of like a, a movement, except it's also a flash mob. So they, they dispersed within a day. But then, uh, encouraged by it, they, they thought, okay, maybe we can have make some demands. And so one of their key demands was to, uh, because the jurisdiction has this particular case being ruled by the court of the martial law, which makes no sense at all, uh, because it, this is not something that happens during a war. So they uh, argued that the normal uh, judiciary should handle all the cases unrelated to wars, uh, even in the military. And that's how, how it should be anyway, but no legislator would uh, risk their career and propose something like this, because there's a lot of uh, establishment concerns. So um, they organized a larger flash mob in, on the middle of Taipei City and urged everybody to come to show rally and support for this uh, death soldier and for the judiciary reform. And they happened to pick uh, it to be the night of the 3rd of August. And that is like the night of the first day of Coast Cup. And usually we have our birds of feathers, our BOF, that day. And, and in that day, actually, Gov Zero has an entire session of our own uh, with more than seven uh, different track and speakers. So we all decided that the Gulf Zero BOF would just take place on the streets. We'll just join the 1985 folks. And much to our surprise, more than a quarter million people came. There's a lot of people. Right. Taipei City is just over uh, two million people, so a quarter million is a lot. And, and so those are the, the phones that they have. So this is a, what we call a silver cross. <coughs> and uh, and on, on that day, uh, the 1985 people did uh, a few pretty key decisions. First, they remain anonymous. Like, uh, they, they are known by their PPD handles, of course, but they, they remain anonymous otherwise. <coughs> and so they're not <coughs> forming a party, and they deliver a speech saying that any time the society needs us, anybody could be 1985 and organize a flash mob protest just like this one. And then um, the Coast Guard people, the Gulf Zero folks, participated on the street, and we're about this place. And but then we, we discovered something amazing, which is we can't hear whatever the people holding a loudspeaker at the center is talking about. There's just too many people. And there's no uh, internet connection whatsoever, because there's a quarter million people, all the 3G connections are, are overflow, so we, we don't get internet connection anywhere. And then um, people generally are lost. They, I mean, they show rally, they, they wave their mobile phones when people near them do, but they, they're, there's no efficient communication whatsoever. So, so we took it upon us as part of the BOF, just sitting on the street to figure out what to do in situations like this. So that's uh, a, the first time a lot of us uh, looked up things like mesh networking, like the commotion wireless, like the servo project, like, like things like uh, how to enable a good communication pattern in situations like this. So that's sort of the, the point where we crossed um, our concerns. And after the flash mob uh, dispersed and after the government agreed to the main demand, which is moving the, uh, the soldier's case and all future cases into a normal court of law, um, the Coast Guard people had a discussion and, uh, with the 1985 on the Gulf Zero IRC channel. And on that discussion, the 1985 people are, are wondering what kind of legacy should they leave because they, they uh, remain anonymous. And then uh, I proposed that can, they can just release their working documents as a Creative Commons document. And, uh, and that's the birth of a Google, particular Google document called Civic Movement for Dummies. And so in it, it they detailed all the 
from how to get the permit of entering a protest, how to get the medical channels, how to uh, how many like people running for uh, orders and for supplies per square kilometer and things like that, down to the map. Uh, uh, like how to display, how to get LED displays up, how to get music, uh, the sp loudspeakers up, and things like that. Like very, very, very detailed things. So the, the idea is that if you follow from step one to step 14, then you have a civic movement. And then a lot of people started adding like their own ideas into the collaborative document because it's creative commons. Anybody can add upon it. So people started pitching in ideas like, uh, I think there should be a one repeater, a large screen every two blocks so that people can see what's going on because it's relayed and things like that. There should be a, a car sized uh, ambulance channel in case that anyone runs into emergency and things like that. So people started pitching their ideas on the online document. And so after we have the activists and the hackers both in, uh, engaged the open source way, we started engaging ordinary citizens. So for example, the uh, air quality, because the fog smog problem was a problem in Taiwan, uh, we, we did a better visualization interface that displayed the PM 2.5 or O3 level, and that became uh, used in like um, mainstream media weather reporting. Or for example, this is the political um, political donation record, because the campaign finance record, the sunshine record, uh, as mandated by law, uh, everybody who runs for a campaign must submit uh, the campaign donations and how they use it to the what we call the corrected yuan. And the problem being that the law only mandates that they have to submit. It doesn't actually say that the yuan have to publish digitally. So anybody could walk into that door and then look at a watermark PDF, but they're not allowed to bring it with the USB disk or anything, and they can only just print it using this slow printer there and they have to sign on a like uh, like a disclaimer like uh, I don't want to like use this for profit or anything in order to bring those uh, printed copies and the printer is really slow and so there's only a fixed number of pages that one can look at every day anyway so so basically it's a sort of technical mean to not actually wanting any uh, data analysis or any numerical analysis into this sort of data, but there's no there's no law that says they have to publish it digitally. And for some reason, neither party uh, is very eager to pass such a law. I wonder why. So yeah, that that's the the thing. So so then we started a project, a Gov Zero project, uh, on CY Gov Zero, of course. And the thing is that uh, a bunch of people who took the uh, campaign records of the the richest campaigns the legislators and printed them and then scanned them and sent the scans on a um, online drive. And so each grid will look like this. And then a, a hacker uh, used OpenCV to detect the grids and then to separate and then auto skew and to make them into individual grids. And then we made a game. So this is like a regular CAPTCHA game. It was a progress bar that shows you how many um, uh, grids are still not yet identified, and we call it the otaku character recognition. Um, and within the first 24 hours, the first batch of more than 300,000 cells are identified actually five times over by people who just go to the site and help us OCR those records. So we reduce them back to their original form, which is uh, a spreadsheet, but this is of course, ridiculous that it has to go from digital to spreadsheet to PDF to analog and then scan and then back and OCR into digital. But at least this time we put pressure on the corrective union to actually have to do something about it because if they dispute the accuracies, then the best way for them to prove the accuracies is just to publish the files themselves. So this becomes a lobbying campaign. And so with this structured data, we are then able to get the um, number of different companies and how many companies are actually the front of the same company using the company registration data and correlate the donation records of uh, legislators. So that, that went pretty well. And that's the second part of the three-step program into an active hacker civic community. Any questions, observations, or comments before we go to the next part? Does it work? Okay. Um, 
So you showed us a few examples of um, statistical analysis being used on published government data. Um, that was looked quite impressive. But what do you think the potential of this uh, could be? Could it be a lot more useful things be done? Could it be harmful in some way? Even yeah, what do you think about that? Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The the common question here is. So the question was, if I heard it correctly, is that what, what are the other future applications of this kind of data analysis? And if there's a harmful uh, usage of it, how, how could we prevent it or detect it? And that's excellent questions. Um, first is that, as I said, uh, the entire uh, pipeline down from the standard operating procedure of getting into the building to print it and to how to scan it, the software used, and everything is open source. We use only open source software. Um, well, I use Acrobat ClearScan to double check, but the primary pipeline is all open source software. So people could, um, they don't have to trust us, and they, have, they can just verify it by themselves. And if they use it for, for bad, like, uh, I don't know, looking up for, <coughs> for particular companies donating to the legislators they hate, and then um, attack them, then I think that responsibility entirely lies within the people doing that particular action because those data are already there anyway. And the reason why people are not uh, taking action against the political enemies of them is not that they couldn't learn of it. And in fact, most think tanks and most uh, larger um, parties' uh, offices already have something like this. So <clears throat> we're not actually providing them with more data. We're providing uh, people who are not as equipped or as well funded uh, as those think tanks to have the access to the same data and to draw their own conclusions instead of buying into the narratives of the, the people who are already maintaining their own versions of this kind of data. So this is the, the usual reply of like, uh, if we ban cryptography, then only bad guys have cryptography uh, reply. But, uh, but I think this kind of applies on, on this situation as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Two very, very <coughs> real and interesting questions. <coughs> the first one is how we prevent burnout, <coughs> basically. Because all, all the similar things done before the digital age, there's a lot of those efforts in my father's generation. They, they did a lot of this. And they, they all, like, if they're <coughs> against the, the darkness, like the non-transparency, the, the burnout is very severe because the government could just refuse to reply, right? So you have to wait for months and months before there's any even chance of change. And so the, the good thing about like this is that everybody does it in their spare time. To, to play a couple of grids of CAPTCHA only takes two minutes. But it's actually addictive to people play for hours. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a, it's a part-time activity. So we're all sort of part-time activists in the sense that we design the participation and structure it in a way that people, even if they only have 15 minutes of attention or of contribution, there's still something to do uh, with their time or with their attention in addition or instead of just pressing like or share on social media. And, and I think that's the, the real um, way out to prevent burnout is just by nobody actually dedicating 100% of their time on any particular cause but just writing up like the civic movement for dummies, their experience so far was one attempt, and anybody could, based on the Creative Commons um, culture and uh, open source code, to, to do the second attempt, and then the third attempt. And one of those attempts will succeed to a degree, and then they will do a write-up, and then the, the other one will push it a little bit further. But the important thing is this is asynchronous, and this is all different bunch of people in each of those attempts, and that prevents the burnout. And the second question is that, <clears throat> yeah, have we been infiltrated? Uh, well, of course, fully. Uh, there's, there's quite a few <clears throat> parties and legislators, assistants, or even legislators themselves who came to the hackathons to, to learn from us, but also try to influence us. And so this is where the 
policy of each project being uh, independent of each other and nobody speaks for Gov Zero came very, very handy in that uh, there is no central person to remove to disable the, the movement. And even if one project wants to speak for Gov Zero, people know instinctively that Gov Zero doesn't work this way. So, and people would come to us and ask, but what if people post a project doing hate speech or doing, you know, um, I don't know, uh, a prostitution map? Or I, I don't know, they, they came up with all sorts of crazy ideas. And then the standard response would be, yeah, if enough people would just risk their public image and join them as volunteers, then of course this kind of project would grow. But the fact is that if it violates many people's ethics, they just don't get many contributors at all. And this is how open source works, right? So it doesn't need censorship, and it doesn't need a central uh, coordination point to say which projects is allowed and which projects is not allowed. And just by this, we avoid infiltration because, yeah, yes, you're among us, then, then yeah, you should start your own project. And that's, that's the, the only thing this space allows for, basically. There's no... <coughs> Like because it's so easy to fork an entire project, project it doesn't make sense to try to uh, gain control of the project. And because it's so easy to merge two projects together, it doesn't also make sense trying to destroy a project when you can just produce a better version and then win more eyeballs on your own. So this is the, the nature of this space that makes censorship very difficult and collaboration very easy so that people even when they fully infiltrate us and even like announce it this way, they still don't get much leverage. And also we're all volunteers, like nobody's paid, so there's no like funding to cover or anything. So does that answer your question? Cool. <coughs> okay, so that brings us to the zero sunflower digital kit. So as you would remember, <coughs> in August 3rd, there's under the silver cross um, people sit down and try to figure out how to make internet work and how to make communication work in a situation like this so that a situation like this doesn't uh, happen again because for, for us, connectivity and communication are like oxygen and, and on that street people feel sort of just a hypoxia or something. It's like the oxygenated <clears throat> and there's no, no real way to, for any kind of communication. So with that document, uh, the Civic Movement for Dummies, um, we continued the discussion. And 1985, the group uh, behind the movement, who started the movement, moved on, and some, some members of them took the Congress Cinema, uh, which is the interactive thing that uh, did mainstream news for a few days, and then active participation for a week or so, and then people generally lost interest, because compared to real cinema, it's, it's just not that very interesting. So some people from 1985, they started a startup called Watch Out. And then the startup, what, what it does is that it takes the raw feeds of the Congress cinema done by Gov Zero, but they assign two people to watch them uh, entire day, uh, funded uh, like with like a, a regular salary. And then they write the most interesting thing up, just like a baseball commentator would. And then for those fragments of that day's uh, legislation, they would then provide captions and comments and the most, uh, the, the best speech of the day, the worst speech of the day, and things like that. And then they also have a crowdsourced uh, platform so that people could submit in the missed things that they, they missed from the commentaries and that would appear in the next day's uh, news. And then they become one of the syndicated news in one of the Taiwan's um, mainstream media, the, the Apple Daily News because the mainstream media want to appeal to a younger generation, and this is the way how they, they crowdsource their narratives out of the legislation so that they don't have to task their legislative reporters all the time. The, the crowd would just select, upload the most interesting story of that day, and they automatically become the next day's paper news. So it's a win-win for, for everybody. <coughs> so that particular, and we're of course very happy and very supportive of that effort. And uh, so on March 8th, there was an anti-nuke uh, protest and also concert, those two things go together. And then a, the, there was a concert a year ago uh, and also hosted by Green Party Taiwan among other uh, groups. And uh, the 2012 one, 
was a disaster internet-wise because again there was a uh, hundred thousand people who came and so there's no uh, like uh, 3G connection anywhere and they did have a uh, fiber optic line I think 20 megabits or so but they just used their stock Wi-Fi share and try to provide that 20 megabits to everybody and of course that doesn't work and so the it the, the gear just burned up and uh, uh, none of the media people who went, the journalists, they couldn't get their coverage out, their, their camera, when they took the photos, they couldn't get it out. They have to actually walk past all those crowds to find an internet connection or internet cafe and they're very, very unhappy with that. <clears throat> so that was in 2012. So in 2013, um, because those two groups are now in close contact with each other, so I um, volunteered to provide the, the cable and net and radio for this demonstration slash concert. And what we did is that we, we applied for a 100 megabit fiber optic line to the uh, corner of that concert, uh, just uh, behind the, the main projector and camera. And then each of us, about a dozen of us, brings our networking gears, some of them very advanced and running DDWRT or something, but some of them just a, a normal airport express. So all, all that range from the professional to the consumer. And then I figure out a, um, a sort of fallback way, like the main grid with the, um, with the main backbone is the ethernet line, and then we'll just provide ethernet adapters to the journalists, and they can just use this priority lane. And then on top of it, the 5G lane for people who have 5G things. And then, well, I can talk about this for hours, but that's the technical details. The, the upshot is that it was very nice, and even though a few gears burn up, we have actual networking experts uh, with us uh, and su supporting us so that it's uh, very smooth. And we, we didn't dare actually to provide to the, I think, um, 30,000 or so people who showed up because that, that wasn't enough bandwidth. So we didn't even try that. So it's all WPA um, protected. So once the, the show is running and uh, the uh, journalists are happy, they're checking Facebook or something, uh, we're, we're, we've discovered uh, that we still have 20 megabits per second or so of unused bandwidth. And so what do we, what do, we do with this? So it just happens that there's a SDI line that's, that's empty from the port of the main projector and the speaker. So, um, and it just so happens that one of the geeks here is a uh, audio video geek who happens to have a black magic uh, converter that converts the SDI line into the Thunderbolt uh, here. So, so then I connected to Google Hangout and then it just started appear on Google Hangout on YouTube Live unannounced. And because it was raining, actually, almost a typhoon that day, people very much liked to stay at home, which is why the turnout wasn't that great anyway. So when the broadcast link was announced mid-concert uh, mid uh, to their Facebook, to, to our surprise, a lot of people came to the online version because the weather was so bad, and then people started having interesting discussions on the sidebar and, and so on. And we discovered that the, num the people who are online who participate outnumbered the people directly on the front of the stage, and that led us think that we can perhaps provide this kind of service to large civic movements in order to, to engage both the online community and the offline community, and that's the, on, on March 8. So on March 18th, um, there was, um, a very interesting development about 10 days after the anti-new protest. So it just so happens that the Watch Out folks were just watching those parliament um, cinema feeds. And on one of the sessions, um, it cut sh short uh, before about an hour or so, I think, short before its scheduled closing time. And the ending speech was that the speaker was holding the mic and very quickly in 30 seconds announced that the cross straight trade agreement because it has been uh, in parliament without debate uh, over the uh, debate time is automatically passed by the parliament. And that was, those 30 seconds would have been unnoticed if not a, a bunch of people, crowdsourced and paid, are watching like the live feed as part of their job or volunteering. And so, so that got widely reported by Watch Out and then by, by Apple News and then all over the social media. Some of some people didn't even know that the cross trade trade agreement was in the parliament, and so so. But but what is this cross trade trade agreement? This is a interesting artifact of the constitution of Taiwan, which because Taiwan was once the Republic of China, still is, 
according to many. Um, constitutionally, Taiwan thinks China is part of Taiwan. It's just this very large renegade province. And then, uh, conversely, China thinks Taiwan is part of China. It's just this very small renegade province. So, uh, for both sides of the government, a cross-strait trade agreement is a domestic issue, constitutionally. And so, while there are laws that, uh, in Taiwan that mandates that all the executive branch <coughs> dealings with foreign matters, <coughs> any agreements with foreign entities, like with New Zealand or with any other country, must pass a stringent uh, parliament veto and uh, amendment process, such process doesn't uh, uh, um, apply to China because it's domestic, you see. And the, exactly the same thing happens in China. They, they don't have to pass any sort of overseas because Taiwan is part of China. So, uh, so that enables all sorts of interesting uh, trade agreements. But the service trade agreement was the first one that caused this much alarm because comes with it, for example, some uh, electronic telecommunication service could in Taiwan could then be performed by Huawei in China, which alarm some people, I think, very reasonably. And then there's also a bunch of other trade service agreements. And the, the thing is that it could just get smuggled because it doesn't really need um, uh, an overseas, like a, would say, foreign uh, trade agreement. And so there's also an obscure part of Taiwanese law that any regular um, bill in the administration that is domestic, if the parliament has nothing to say for it, for I think two months or so, in, or three months, then it's automatically passed. So using both this loophole and the constitutional loophole that China is part of Taiwan, uh, this trade agreement was just passed largely unnoticed um, in, in the legislative, and that uh, provoked a lot of outcry. So it was, um, it was noticed in time, and then on that night, uh, on the 18th, there was a, this large protest slash concert Again, the same thing uh, uh, to to uh, flash mob and to call the government to to withdraw this kind of trade agreement, and so so yeah, I, I went there and then set up this um, YouTube hangout and whatever just like ten days ago here. Um, but the, the the person manning the camera um, here in the Taiwan, um, who's very experienced and uh, very expert in running like live concerts and things like that. Um, he was the one of the organizers of a live concert um, in, in the independent music. So he was very good with, with the camera. And I'm okay with the internet. Even though they don't have an internet connection, uh, I have a okay HSDPA plus, which happens to be this phone, um, that provides the out link. But the thing is that Indy used, unlike us, a desktop machine, which has no Wi-Fi card whatsoever. So there's no way for me to uh, broadcast his signal out because there's no Wi-Fi connection. <clears throat> and it just so happens that one of the groups who did this uh, protest and attended concert was called the Black Island Youth um, Front. And uh, this Black Island Youth, uh, I, I didn't know them before, but one of the, the young students there had this Windows laptop. And so he's like, yeah, okay, I, I see that the, the problem you have and I'm not going to use this laptop anyway, so why don't you just set up the win uh, internet sharing so that I can use this laptop, which happens to have an internet port to connect to the desktop, so the signal could flow from the desktop to the laptop, to my phone, and to the internet. And I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, but, but I, I heard that this concert will run well into the midnight. Uh, would, would you not need your laptop by then? And then he's like, no, I'm not needing my laptop, like, Ever anymore, and this is a very strange thing for a person to say. Um, and but I, I noticed the curiosity, but I didn't ask further. Uh, I mean, it's donated equipment, and we're already late. So so I just um, set up all the wires, and then it's broadcasted in real time. And after I, I set up those um, wires and things, uh, because we all do it in part time, so we have shifts. Actually, the one after me is Benef and Brofius, two Golf Zero hackers. So I'm like, okay, I'm going home. This is all working, so I can go home and then watch the, the concert from my, you know, home. And then, uh, but just before uh, Brofius and Benef came, and just after I left, the aforementioned students um, just jumped over the Prolino walls. Uh, so we were we were demonstrating or having a concert uh, nearby the Prolino, but students went into the other side of the wall and just 
climb over the wall and broke into the parliament. And it took everybody by, by surprise. So uh, the first thing they noticed was uh, that it was very messy there. After the 32nd incident, none of the legislator bothered to clean up. So they actually had to clean up after the legislators. And then um, a, a guy put up a pair of sandals on an iPad and then uh, started with a WiMAX connection and then it's on um, Ustream. And the R1, which was the broadcast I helped setting up, is still going on with the concert. And then uh, Profius and Venev came with a large high tripod and a professional DV and they captured uh, on real time the first seconds, the first minutes of the students breaking in. And so <coughs> that became very important the very next day because the mainstream media painted the protesters as mobsters who fought with police and, and damaged property and things like that. But on the real time footage, uh, that it took, we could very clearly see that there's almost no police, nobody expect anybody pulling off something like that, and the only thing that gets broken is a glass door. And then um, and then, as soon as police try to surround it, uh, they were anti-surrounded by people who watched the video footage coverage from afar, and then the concert people called everybody to come to, to the site to anti-surround the police. So once the police are anti-surrounded, they dare not do anything. So on the street here, and then street there, which is the, the other part of Palaiman where the student broke in, um, we rushed in, Graph Zero people rushed in to set up wireless connection there and also have a lot of camera there. So we have uh, video coverage of all the three main sites. And then people wanted to do something, so they flocked to the space that we usually do something, which is hackpad. And the Graph Zero hackpad, uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's 5,000 people typing together. And so Hackpad was down, the entire Hackpad was down. And, and Hackpad was like, yeah, we're proud to support open government activism. We're reworking infrastructure to support the height and load, and we're back. And by reworking infrastructure, they mean they have a dedicated EC2 Amazon instance, just for Cup Zero, so that when we get down again, it doesn't bring the rest of their paying customers down. So thank, thanks them, of course. And that the converse side is that when they pushed a software update that brought the rest of the hackbed down, the Cup Zero hackbed is still up. So that's a win-win situation. So um, there's 5,000 people on the hackpad at the moment, and they're just typing down whatever they heard from the three different video feeds, and that became the real-time transcript. And then after the is back up, uh, we diverted a bunch of people, and they became the real-time translation uh, squad that took the Chinese transcripts and published the English transcripts, and then the fact-checking, and then the um, images and uh, storytelling crew. So a pipeline formed literally overnight. And then the other use of spreadsheets uh, on the next day was to have supplies. So uh, then after they got uh, safely back home and the next shift is JJ, uh, then uh, did a sort of a human bridge between the Reddit-like um, bulletin board system and the Google Forms, as you saw um, on the very beginning of the talk, where every column is a site and every row is the kind of thing that they need on that site. So uh, she relayed the messages back and forth between those two forums so that people with the most uh, like upvoted <coughs> uh, need is reflected on the forums and vice versa. And so it was uh, very um, dynamic and things from trivial things like uh, vegetable uh, lunch bar box, which is actually not very trivial, but protesters trapped in the parliament to the network gears, to the everyday items and things like that. Our, con um, our uh, electricity and spare like loudspeakers and things like that are being um, collected on the Google form uh, over there. And then the next day, we, <coughs> because the internet connection was just so bad, we decided that we'll just use WiMAX, which is like nobody used it in, in Taiwan. It was a failed experiment, but the towers are still there. So the bandwidth is very, very clear, while the 3G and HSDPA is all very flooded. So we just bought a lot of YMX gear and just uh, smuggled them or transferred them into the occupied area and then set up the same uh, Ethernet adapters, which very conveniently I bought like 20 or 30 of them 10 days ago uh, for the anti nuke um, protest. So those were shipped in. And then we had this hack folder called the Congress Network 
that just started doing the topology and network planning and things like that uh, to manage the WAMEX solution for those three sites. And then we rebranded our hack folder called uh, Gov Zero Today so that it's in a separate namespace than our usual hackathons and projects so that our usual business is not disrupted. <laughs> like all these, um, I think uh, at peak there's maybe yeah, half a million concurrent viewers, so, so we naturally want uh, a um, like fastly CDN GitHub pages uh, handled uh, traffic instead of the usual either calc based traffic. And, and that's again also used this time. And then we apply for, for the landline of HiNet. The, the HiNet people would say that they've never, the telecommunication company would, would later say that they, they have never saw a apply to installation uh, form like this because we just say, uh, on the street corner next to the 7-Eleven where the loudspeakers are. And so, so we apply for a 100 megabit line. It usually would have taken five days, but it was done in just two days. Maybe they also very want to watch the live video coverage. But the day after, uh, there, there was this called the darkest day ever, as a faction of people decided to attack into the main government building, not only the Pearline. They, those two are fairly close. Too. And then we have our iPad uh, in the field team for live broadcast and that follow them. But there's again two different wings in the executive administration building. So the one that has the live video coverage, uh, there's very little political violence. And we also call the protester breaking windows and things like that. But the other wing, there's a lot of police brutality there, and there's no coverage. We will later be told that because there's no uh, people holding visible cameras, and uh, later on the journalists who did arrive with the visible cameras, police just segmented them out. So there's a lot of police brutality. So, so that's when we decided that we cannot go without those cameras. Those cameras are priority one. So um, we crowdsourced the, the cameras. We printed this badge called the Civic Journalism Badge, and on the back of it, it said. Uh, the constitutional interpretation that protects any ordinary citizen as long as it is of public concern to function as a member of the media and uh, it is legal. This is a constitutional interpretation done just a few years ago and we dug it out out of our database and then it seems to apply very well in this case. There are two interpretations and we even get a QR code to the interpretation on the government website. And so wearing this, and this is actually an online form, so you can just upload your own uh, a photo and type in your name and then it's already a four printed uh, batch that, that you can just fold it and then and bring your iPad or mobile phone and run to the front line. And so, so we enlisted a crowdsourced fleet of uh, real-time footage and <coughs> that became very important. And then the, the day later, Justin TV also offered to um, have like real real-time coverage hosting support for, for us. Uh, we're still using Ustream actually at that point. And uh, we have a, a website called 123 that's basically just a list of uh, legislators' contact number, which we had a previous project that had it, but now it's converted into a like lookup based on your uh, geographic <coughs> location. You're a legislator and this is the number, and then you can just press here to dial it if you're on mobile phone, and then um, tell them that please treat cross-trade uh, agreements as foreign trade agreements and pass a overseas law, thank you, and then hang up. And so that's a, a way to apply pressures, as crowdsourcing the pressures. And then there's a discuss um, forum just below this, this website so that people actually compare their scripts and develop more effective scripts and things like that. They just happen in a very organic fashion on this website. And uh, on the 28th, a bunch of um, People set up the Skywatch closed cam system on the already applied landline and uh, IP over power grid so that each street and each corner and some donated by residential housings um, is covered by at least one camera, sometimes two or three. And after that uh, particular day, there's zero uh, police brutality and zero people missing and very few people injured, even if just slightly, uh, after we got all this cam set up on the protesting area. So that's uh, 10 days of occupation. And then predictably, just like yesterday, uh, it became uh, appear that there's a lot of anti-protest protesters started showing up and started having conflicts. 
and started like having their own like love the country rally rallies. And then we, we behaved very kindly. We as in GovZero, we, we uh, assigned like people just volunteer actually to cover uh, their their anti-protest protest uh, just as any few reporter would, which reduced the, the conflict not very surprisingly. And also that uh, they didn't actually know how to run a protest. They, that is their first time. They don't even know how to run a loudspeaker or a projector or things like that. So I uh, collected all the information uh, we did, which is a Creative Commons document of the anti-nuke protest, including how to say about all those things, and forwarded it to those anti-protest protesters. So in a sense, we're also supporting the anti-protest protest. But in a way, that makes them more civil. And in a way, that makes them just uh, say what they have to say, um, as segregated their own area and watched by cameras all over, so that they feel that they they made their point and they don't uh, interfere on the protesters. And I think that's a pretty civil thing to do. But partly in, incited by this, on the very next day, there's a half a million young people now, and and on the same spot as as the August protest. And all the plans magically came true. There really is a, a LED screen every two blocks. There really is a large ambulance uh, like lane uh, that people would just automatically maintain. There really is uh, sufficient supplies and water and things like that every couple of blocks, every some number of kilometers. It, it all could be looked up on the documents. So it's, it, it's just like a magical manifestation of the online collaboration into offline demonstration. And then we felt emboldened enough to do what we didn't do on Nikon and Antinuk, uh, which is to offer public Wi-Fi access to everybody on the protesting area. And <clears throat> that, that was done by uh, actually computer science professors in the CSI in National Taiwan University in their um, connectivity, some sort of students. They brought these free BSD boxes running PFSense and the professional kind of software setup and connected to our existing trunk and set up all sort of virtual lines and things like that with a lot of decoys. And with, uh, I think my network knowledge stuff at this point. And, and other than that, they say something more, but I don't actually understand them. So it's supposedly very secure and robust. And then we have two sites. Uh, both offering Gov Zero Public. And it's actually a capturing portal, so people who connect it for the first time will see Gov Zero Point IO, which has both the uh, real-time transcript of a <coughs> student in the Occupy area that types very, very fast and types for a very long time, who types everything she hears on the top, and then the, <coughs> the crowds would also see the uh, news e-form, which is a bunch of student reporters uh, generally trusted and had the booth next to the Gov Zero booth that does a, a real-time coverage of what happens. So people could just go to the uh, site there and then start pulling out their mobile phone and even if they don't have a connection, they will see critical information and then map in the hackpad and then they will be told that you can download Telegram, you can download FireChat and you can start uh, collaborating with people around you using those tools. So that's um, how we did it. And then once we are on the same local area network, then we might as well start sitting on a Lumio instance and then have the networking people um, start voting what next to do and things like that. And so uh, have democracy among ourselves. And then the Civil Constitutional Convention, um, they, they also introduced their own voting system, which is decidedly offline. It's the Occupy Wall Street uh, hand gestures. And so they started having discussions about how to make a better constitution that doesn't suffer from all those constitutional loopholes. And they started having discussion with it, and we mirrored both the Lumia discussions and the constitutional uh, discussions because there's transcripts and live <coughs> uh, YouTube foot footage that we could link uh, both ways. And so after um, 20 odd days of these activities, Finally, the leader, the speaker of the parliament agreed that they will actually pass an additional law that considers cross-trade agreements as uh, like foreign trade agreements. And so that's like the demand, demand of the students and then people just went back home very peacefully and without any casualties and there's actually a, a large concert and everything like that. So, so yeah, that, that was the story of the March movement. And I, I posted um, 
shortly before uh, this whole thing ended, saying that uh, when I supported the March 18th concert, um, I didn't know that people would actually climb over walls at the parliament. But once there are people inside that parliament wall, then only a neutral internet can connect people from within the wall and outside the wall. Communication uh, could just reduce conflict and misunderstanding, and that is my only and my still motivation. And that's <coughs> the story in March. And as the well, one of the Cop Zero folks work on this, who would actually later work with the government, with the administration, so that they adopt all this system, and then in their sort of reform campaign, uh, started to have a real git book and uh, crowdsourced and YouTube-based discussions with the public so that they don't lose on this new media sort of way. So yeah, and child <coughs> said this, that uh, we maintain the principle of transparency because if we believe in the power of open and transparency, we should wield it to conquer darkness. And so yeah, if only 1% due to what we did uh, in that there's many not many people injured and not at all anyone missing, then I think uh, the effort is worth it. And I very much hope that in Hong Kong, um, using the same technological stack, people could get what they want, which is a popular vote nomination, and go back home very safely. So to, to finish the talk, I'll quote uh, one of my social tech colleagues, my, uh, Michael Ignopoulos, who did a PhD actually in philosophy, and that's, that's his, um, chapter in the telepistemology, I think he's the only uh, philosopher who used this word. It means to know something from a distance. Uh, mediation and the design of transparent interfaces. That book is called The Robot in the Garden. It's about a robot arm that tends a garden that could be controlled over the internet. It's one of the earliest web interaction uh, experiments. I think it was 1990-something, um, right? So. Um, in, in it, he argued that what makes internet telegardening just a little bit like traditional gardening is that people could just feel a connection, not a causal connection to the garden, but a epistemic connection. That is, people can just like watching the moon over a telescope, see something that they couldn't see elsewhere. It's not inferred. It's not something that you can get from any other channel. And just by this, people could feel engaged in a garden maybe thousands of kilometers away and to want to uh, see it grow and want to make it better, want to take their time to tend the garden, which is how I feel about um, Hong Kong at this moment since I'm literally uh, in the past and there in the future. We're six hours away and six time zones away. So that's my talk. And finally, we have a um, submit if people are having travel plans to Asia around November, we have a summit that brings a lot of, in a conference that brings a lot of uh, thinkers and actors uh, in the same space, including Shirkin and Yves, and then a lot of different, there's Lumios, Mulai, the Chile, FCI, from Korea, Mass Society, and of course, very importantly, the people who are actually on the ground running the protest, the code of Hong Kong, people will come to Taiwan to talk about their experience. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, observations, thoughts? Yeah, because the telecommunication company people uh, really wanted to see high quality uh, video feeds. Because with WiMAX, we can only run 240p at most. And with a landline, uh, we, we only got a 50 megabits, actually. There, there was some problem with the equipment. But uh, they, they could see uh, like 1080p. And I think that's a large motivation for them. Uh, people in TW Nick and I see actually help a lot trying to convince the uh, actual people involved that this is uh, kosher. And also the the um, the Constitutional Court also that the highest the Supreme Court in Taiwan just at the day before I asked for the landline ruled that the flash mob is legal because a uh, demonstration that's premediated must get a certificate to use the street, but as long as people come to there on their own volition without any premediation or any organization, and like flash mob, 
then that's, that's legal. It, it's, it's not something that could be banned. And actually, we, we've been thinking about applying for the land line since the very first night. But we, we knew that it would be illegal. That was the constitutional ruling. And on that very night, and I was in the parliament building actually tweeting when, when this ruling, the news of this ruling came to me over Twitter. And I'm like, yeah, now we can get a landline. So the landline was not to the parliament building, it was to the 7-Eleven street corner outside the parliament building. And from there, we, we started relays and IP over electric lines. Well, I personally am pretty overwhelmed by the talk, um, and I'm, I'm desperate, so I'm desperately trying to translate this here into Austria, and I will have to be fail, of course. Um, I personally would be interested to hear whether there, there's a project going on um, observing activities of government, financial activities, very closely. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, crude corruption where money exchange against favor is actually going over several stations. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex field and you uh, need to keep a lot of data and everything. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some actual issues there? Yeah, the, the main problem is that <coughs> the government is only obliged to publish data stored in banks and financial institutions within their sovereign and mostly data, uh, sorry, money just exchange hands in. Uh, like British Isle of something or other uh, extra um, territorial st states. So, so that's actually a really big problem because the, the statistical analysis we could do is actually for middle or lower scale corruption. And we are fully aware that the highest level corruption happens elsewhere. But, but what, we, what we could do is we work with uh, data scientists. Uh, there's a data science convention actually that just coincide with the hackathon is the same day, so we brought the data scientists together, and one of them actually specialized in this kind of problems. So basically, we just treat them as domain experts and supplied uh, the technical help, whatever they might need, but we defer to their knowledge to how to uh, track these uh, issues. And if you're interested, I'm sure that we can exchange like more hyperlinks after the talk. But yeah, I personally don't know uh, sufficiently to know which direction to take. But uh, part of the value of hackathons is that people who actually know which direction to take will start talking to open source activists and they don't have to write all their R code or MATLAB code by themselves. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, so, if it's early, you said that somehow 10,000 people who are working on uh, translating I'm not translating, but uh, like Experts. digitalizing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like spreadsheets and stuff. Yes. Uh, Otaku character. How do you get 10,000 people? Yeah, exactly that. Mm -hmm. How do you get 10,000 people in a country like Taiwan? And mm -hmm. how, how many citizens do you have? Uh, uh, million. Yeah, 20, 20 something million. Yeah. yeah, but it's still even quite mm -hmm. impressive how you get 10,000 people mm -hmm. to do something that's not particularly exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, it's actually very relaxing, I guarantee you. But <laughs> yeah, um, that, that, that's a very fair question. The, the thing is that, the thing is, of course, to, to provoke outrage. Uh, this, is, this is a lot of people feel uh, powerless while angry about the fact that the campaign donation records is kept by the government, is known by the government and the taxation and the top level think tanks and the parties, but just not available to the ordinary citizens. So people do already feel pretty both angry and powerless about it. And so when we made it a news, like mainstream news thing, and especially when the Corrective UN, the, the building being ocr in this way, issued a statement uh, um, be seeking, like beseeching the Gov Zero hackers to think twice, uh, before engaging on such a crowdsource campaign, it has the um, uh, the opposite effect. It's called the Streisand effect, right? Like the, the more you want to uh, fight something publicly, it just made more people aware of it. So so people see the, the obvious um, hypocrisy uh, of this stance. And then we went back to the law and we saw that, okay, this, this is not to be used for malicious purpose, for commercial purpose, and let's just it's actually one of the, the points in their regulations. So we just copied that sentence 
verbatim to this game site and say, okay, by playing this game, uh, you, you agree that you're not using this data uh, for malicious purposes and we're just furthering the, the government's goal or something. Yeah, but the, the, the thing is that it became a sort of um, um, satire uh, on the way that the government is treating this so that it doesn't escalate in a sort of attrition sort of way, but it escalated in a popular imagination sort of way, and that captured more people's imagination and it went viral, of course, many times on um, uh, civic media and then uh, social media, and then people would just take five minutes and play a little bit. Most people just play for 10 cells or something. Yeah. Which is not much, it's just a minute yeah, at most. Uh, so in the workshop you gave in Hong Kong mm -hmm. a couple of days before mm -hmm. this started, what do, uh, are you teaching? What mm -hmm. what was the topic? Sure, uh, this is the plural you because I, I was in Germany, but the the people, the 1985, the watch out people actually uh, came to to Hong Kong uh, for a new media I think conference, and they talk about the the laws governing the internet media, about uh, reporting, about how to make. Uh, like new narratives based on crowdsourced information and things like that. So they, they are a media company and they, they did a workshop on like using these tools to support their narratives. So GovZero doesn't actually, most of the GovZero project doesn't have a story on their own, but Storytellers is empowered with a lot of those analysis stories so that they could present a, a more, more larger scope story without investing too much time in individual details themselves because a lot like voting records or donation records are automatically generated for anyone anyway. So uh, they could just start from that as their starting point and to build narratives based on that. And I think the workshop was uh, some, somewhat about this point as well. So um, yeah, the, the question is uh, the life cycle of a GovZero project. Uh, first, uh, anyone could start a GovZero project and call it a GovZero project. And then on their GitHub page, there must be a license file and there must be a file called GovZero.json that uh, describes the project, its aim, its, its stage of maturity, and things like that. And there's a scraper that will um, get the GovZero.json declaration from the GitHub. And there's also an online form that you can submit a JSON file, not necessarily in GitHub, uh, maybe you want to host it yourself on GitLab or something, into the main directory. And from there, it will just appear on the bulletin of, of GovZero syndication. And then people could just start getting like random volunteers just by, by way of becoming in it. And then if people are willing to open source and create common all their work uh, and leave it to the general GovZero, uh, organization, then they do a fork to organization on GitHub, usually, and then assign it to the GovZero dev team, which is a lot of people, and they basically have a communal ownership on that project. So a lot of project starts as a personal repository, and then after maybe three people are interested in it, they agree on a general license and then fork into the GovZero namespace. And at which point, it starts being eligible for, if it's obviously replacing or augmenting some government websites, um, uh, contents, then it starts being eligible, and basically it's gave pretty liberally actually. So, so any project at this stage is usually a month or two old, and we know the people. And if, even if they decide to leave or if they decide to take a different direction, then we usually just have sufficient people in the common community to to just take over the project and run with it. And so then they add a CNAME uh, file to their GH pages branch. On that GitHub, there's something that g0b.tw, which will automatically uh, redirect into the GitHub uh, CDN servers, and that's how a Gov0 uh, project is made. And this describes actually a sort of a paradigm shift, because this only works for single page applications or static websites. Um, and the way we, we hack this is that most of our largest projects, like the Congress Matter, they actually run out of a 404.html file. 
because if you have that file in your GH pages, any link whatsoever goes to that page, and then you parse location that uh, path, and then do a sufficiently uh, advanced dispatch using Angular JS or React or whatever, and then and then it behaves like a real website, and then it's shared like a real website with OG image and everything, but it's actually only static. And so we invest a lot of time into backend storage like either Calc or Firebase or any of those uh, Mongo Lab and things like that that would host the actual data uh, in a in a publicly viewable and replicable place. We're considering a sandstorm actually for, for this kind of things too and just redirect to it. And I can go on technical details forever, but that's the general life cycle. Any other not necessarily questions, comments, observations, feedbacks? If we're good, then feel free to talk to me anytime, and thanks for attending.